Hello everyone, welcome to the Bangalore PhD Master. We are honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rishi Patel. Rishi is a research scientist at Google Research. He did his PhD from Georgia Tech and then held food doctor positions at PMU, Princeton, and PMU. Then he worked at IBM for a few years before moving to his current position at Google. His research interests mainly lie in the field of algorithms, machine learning, and complexity. Today we will be talking about learning relay thresholds from the other positions. So thank you, thank you uh, for the for the invite uh, to be back in my uh, physically. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this talk, uh, while there are some uh, results that I'll be talking about, I'll be results. I think I would uh, sort of uh, uh, pitch this talk as more of a, a new area, not a new area, but a like generalization of what is what has usually been studied in learning right? and which is becoming more and more important now. So that is the main, I would say, the message that I would want to convey from this talk, apart from the results that, that are there, showing that this area is actually interesting and worth actually looking at. So yeah, so this is learning linear thresholds from level proportions. So learning probably everybody knows, sort of uh, talk about that. Linear thresholds are just half spaces, maybe people also know about that. But what are these level proportions? So, so, so let me just talk about the traditional supervised learning model. Right? Uh, so that's a fact, probably approximately correct model of uh, variance, where uh, so you are given some training examples. Um, so uh, feature vectors x. Uh, now I'm using these terms. So vectors x and labels f of x, where f, f is some uh, unknown function from some function class. Right, and uh, so you sample a bunch of these examples uh, from some distribution, and then you need to efficiently output some hypothesis H such that under that distribution, H agrees with F, the target uh, function, with high probability. Right, uh, so let's say these are just the Boolean functions over either the three dimension reals or the three dimension Boolean uh, hypercube. Right, so if this happens, if this can be done efficiently, then you say that the class of these functions f can be efficiently learned by the class of the functions, the hypothesis class. Right, uh, for example, we know that linear threshold functions, which are just half spaces, can be efficiently learned by half spaces. Right, uh, so I denote an uh, LTF uh, by this uh, pos of r dot x plus c, uh, where pos function is just one if the pos of a is one if a is greater than zero and zero. Right, so this is the sign function, right? So, uh, and we also know, for example, I mean, there are many results. Uh, just, so two-term DNFs can be learned by degree two polynomial threshold functions. This is again just by linear program. Both these things can be done by uh, <coughs> linear program, right? So, so this this is a very well studied area you know, for the past nearly 40 years or something, right? Uh, but now. Uh, uh, I mean, more general variants of this uh, this setup are sort of becoming more and more important. Although they have been studied in machine learning for the last 10, 15 years, but there are very, very few papers still. Even in that area and in computational learning, almost no papers, right? Nobody has studied this. So the problem is that, I mean, in, in traditional learning, you are given these vectors, feature vectors, and a label for each of the feature vectors, right? And you can basically want to train a model on, on this training set, right? But what if you don't have the labels? For feature vectors, of course, this is also something that has been uh, studied: the super, semi-supervised learning, unsupervised learning. But uh, nowadays, what is happening is that you are not given labels for like individual feature vectors, but given like aggregate labels for like bunch of feature vectors. So, in the previous slide, the LTA uh, was the uh, hypothesis or the function. Oh, both of them. Both of them. You can learn LTFs. Uh, the function class, the concept class of LTF using LTFs as hypothesis. In general, hypothesis could, could be more general, but ideally you would want them to be as close to the function class that you want. Yeah, so, so in, in this uh, case, uh, let, let's say the labels are not available for individual features. By the way, I mean, you, you please ask me questions if you have. Right? Uh, I'm happy to answer them. So, so this, uh, can this sort of situation, right, where you don't have uh, you know, labels for individual feature vectors, can happen because of privacy concerns. You don't want to reveal the labels for individual feature vectors. Right? In many medical applications, right, you may not want to reveal like uh, whether a particular 
you know, a patient has a disease or not. Right? Maybe what you can reveal is like for a bunch of patients, well, how many of them have disease? Right? So this is the aggregate label that I'm talking about. Right? The sum of uh, the labels for a subset of features. Right? So that can happen due to privacy concerns, legal considerations. There could also be situations where your supervision, right? Because typically uh, someone has to annotate uh, the label for each feature vector, right, in your training set, <clears throat> and that could be a costly operation. Right? So maybe you can only estimate like the average label for a bunch of feature vectors. That also occurs in uh, many real world applications. So medical image classification, where you maybe you know that okay, roughly speaking, okay, these out of these many you know X rays, how many percentage of them are like have some disease? Or instead of knowing whether each one of them has a So maybe the, the X-ray itself is divided into many, many parts. You know that in general, okay, this is the percentage of area that is affected, but then that's all you know. If you don't know whether each individual thing is an affected part or not. So, so there is this, uh, some other applications in uh, uh, IVF prediction where you have like a bunch of cells, you only know the aggregate outcome of those cells, right? Uh, uh, but uh, you don't know the individual outcome for each of us. That could also be because of privacy. Uh, so there are some other applications in physics and so on. So this, this area of, uh, uh, <coughs> of uh, learning is called learning from regular purposes. That's the I mean, it's an app name because you now have like either some or uh, average label for uh, average and some makes uh, no difference because you know the set of feature vectors, right? You know the number of feature vectors. So knowing the average is same as knowing the sum of labels, right? Uh, so, so this is learning from label proportions where the training set has what we call bags of feature vectors, right? These are subsets of feature vectors or instances with label proportions for each bag, right? Uh, of each bag. And the goal is to train a instance level classifier. So you still want to predict at the instance level, right? You don't want to predict uh, like at some aggregate level. Your your job name is the same. You want to train a, a instance level classifier using this bag level training. So you have aggregate training data, and you want to train do the same thing. There. If you support of the bags, the entire so are they, uh, would you have data points for every uh, x in the feature domain? No, not necessarily, right? It could be coming from some distribution or something. Right. In fact, one of the questions is whether the bag distribution is consistent with your test distribution, right? Which is an instance level distribution. In general, it could even be like there could be some distribution shifts and so on. Yeah. That could happen, yeah. This is a slightly different formulation than three noisy labels. Yeah, there's no noise here. Right? Then your label proportions are consistent with your uh, your unknown classifier, right? So there's no actual noise. Maybe I'm kind of digressing into solutions rather than like, I can't look at it as follows. Like I, I look at every feature vector in the bag, consume hmm. the average as the distribution associate, and then reduce the problem to, to the size. No, so you know the feature vectors in the bag. You don't know its label. So what, yes, I what I'm saying is I'll, I'll look at the aggregate as a prior. Yeah, so but then let's say you're doing a regression problem, right? It's bad. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to predict the average. So you're basically not really predicting the actual levels, right? So, uh, so it's a bit tricky. Tricky enough that it's not even obvious. No, I'll tell you how obvious that that part is. <laughs> it's actually very hard. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is the uh, the setup. I mean, this is a general setup, right? Uh, in the sense, like if it's a binary hmm. uh, label, hmm. I can just give you the bag as the, all the data. Yeah. Let's say half of them are zero, half of them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the bag is really big, and you 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 only know that half of them are zero, half of them are. But there are multiple bags. It's not just one bag, right? So you have many many bags. So maybe you can just look at those bags and try to figure out. Bags could also be overlapping, so maybe you can maybe add and subtract bag, do things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so so okay, so this talk I'll. So there were these two uh, papers that I had in Europe. I mean, actually, the second one is the sequel to the first one. So, so I looked at this problem from the computational learning perspective, and I think this is the these are the first papers that actually looked at this problem from a learning theory perspective, where you actually formulate it as a uh, 
uh, uh, uh, back learning type of uh, type of setting. Nobody, has, I mean, at least to my knowledge, people have not looked at it. I mean, there have been uh, like more applied papers in machine learning, and that too very few. If you look at like, uh, I mean, this this literature in LLP has existed, learning from labor professions. LLP has existed for the last 15 years, probably, right? But if you look at those 15 years, you might find like maybe two, three dozen papers in an area, which means that it's an extremely small area. Now it is becoming more and more important because of privacy. Do you still want to pack privacy, like the standard value? Yes, yeah, so I'll they, they tell you the model. No, you don't know the label of every X in the bag. Uh, what about the feature sections? You know the feature vectors. You know the vectors. You know, like, okay, this bag has these 20 feature vectors, but you only know that, okay, seven out of these 20 are ones and the 13 are zeros, but you don't know which one of them are one or zero. So, so the less variance of the, uh, uh, of the features in the bag, the better uh, Less variance, actually, that might be. Counterintuitive. You probably need more variance to fit a model, but I mean, yeah, so that's a secondary question. I mean, we are just looking at the uh, the model right now. Depending on what you want to do, maybe you want. I mean, the label should be. Uh, I mean, for example, if I tell you, okay, I mean, the label proportion, if it's like one or zero, then it's easy. You know the actual uh, uh, labels for the feature vectors. Right? Then it becomes an easier. Problem. So the problem is when you have uncertainty. <coughs> So uh, yeah, so, so 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 let's try to formulate this as a in the traditional pack learning setting, right? So what does pack learning in traditional uh, the traditional pack learning actually simulate? What it simulates is, uh, I mean, what it basically abstracts out is that you have a training set, and the best really you can, if you want to train a model on the training set, best you can do is basically fit the model on the training set, right? And then there are these generalization bounds which say that okay if you have a test distribution from this test set from the same distribution then basically you the error is uh, whatever error you get on the training set is basically the same on the uh, test set right so you really want to fit on the test set uh, sorry the training set your, your model you want to fit on the optimize on the training set that's what the pack learning model does uh, framework that, right so so you really want to optimize on the training data in this case also so so really you want to measure how well your hypothesis can classify the bags that you have in the training data. Now you have bags, you don't have instances, right? Uh, so that is basically how we model this in the, so you just have a bunch of bags, all you can basically do is uh, take your whatever classifier you want to learn and take the best classifier with respect to the bags that you have. But that's actually not true. You could, there, there are other information that you could have, distribution information, you could try to, uh, I mean, in general, it may not be true, but this is a very reasonable model of, uh, you know, formulating this in the computational, uh, reasonable way of formulating this in the computational learning, right? Articulate this, uh, this classify. Yeah, so classify, for us, classify is just match the label proportion. So that's what uh, we'll, we'll use, right? And it is, okay, so let me first define this, right? So you have a space of feature vectors, uh, let's say d-dimensional, real sort of dimensional Boolean vectors. And the bags are, there's a set of bags. Okay, the set of all bags is just all possible uh, subsets of bags, right? Uh, so for a particular uh, classifier, which is just a mapping from the feature vector to zero one, you define the, you define for a particular bag, <coughs> the average label as sigma B comma F, uh, right? So B, for bag B and the function F, you just define the average label within that, right? And the training examples are given as a set of B comma sigma BF. Right? F you don't know, you want to actually learn. And you want to basically train some hypothesis X consistent with that. Right? So what is this consistency? We say that the hypothesis satisfies the bag B if the label proportions match. Right? So you want to match the label proportions. That's the notion of satisfaction. Now this is not the only notion of satisfaction that you can have. If you have a really large bag, you may not want to match exactly the label proportion. It may not be a bank, zero one thing, right? You may want to get close to the label proportion and so on, but this is a reasonable thing for small bags. If you have like a diagonal size two, three, or four, you pretty much want to match the label proportion, right? So for small bags, it makes sense. Larger bags, uh, you may have more general notions of satisfaction. So the goal is that you have these collections of uh, Let's say bags and their uh, you know label proportion sample from some distribution, 
we want to find the hypothesis which maximizes the number of satisfied satisfied ones right and as i said strict consistency makes it for small guys to begin with Mm. Yeah, they're still consistent. Yeah. So that's a. Uh, I know, no, that's actually a natural thing. I mean, you don't really know. I mean, you are giving me a situation where the level proportion is half, right? So the true classifier as well as its complement both will satisfy those bands, right? But that is okay. You still are learning the classifier uh, with uh, up to negation. Not bad. The model is slightly different. You're not like the bags themselves are being drawn. Yeah, yeah. So this is all with respect to bags only. I'm not really even looking at the test data. I'm looking at how well you can optimize on bags. But other possible hypotheses might be from RB to uh, some some distribution. Whereas here you want to satisfy bags rather than for every point in. Yeah, that's right. So this is modeling of what you can do with your training bags, right? You just want to optimize on the training bags for now, right? And uh, you can actually prove in some other works here that if you have some uh, random bags and a random test distribution, then satisfying bags is basically the same as satisfying. Excuse me. If the bags are non overlapping, is it possible to satisfy all of them? Sure. I mean, uh, there's always, I mean, so here bags are all. There is some classifier. You are given this guarantee that there is some classifier that satisfies all of them. So there, whether you can find such a classifier, that's the problem. That's the algorithmic problem that we have. But the joint bags are probably uh, yes. yeah. You can you can you can find. I mean, in the extreme case, right? All bags are of size one. They are all the joint, obviously. Right. And, and yeah, you can learn uh, half spaces using half spaces by just by linear programming. So by the way, so this is a, as a just to reiterate, this is a strict, gen, I mean, a direct generalization of traditional supervised learning. Traditional supervised learning is basically all bags are of size one. So and people have not studied it. I mean that much. <clears throat> okay. So our focus is going to be learning uh, linear threshold, which is a half spaces. Okay. So this is what a half space uh, looks like. It is the sign of some linear form. Um, so, at the instance level with batch of size one, a half space is uh, or LTF is efficiently learnable using LTF to arbitrary accuracy. You just basically write, you can write those constraints as a linear program and solve them. Right? Uh, so you can basically using linear programming, you can find an LTF satisfying all the training examples. Uh, but uh, yeah, so question is in this LLP thing, right, where your batch of size is greater than one, can you do the same? What is the complexity of learning these ideas? Right, so that was the first paper. Let's say just back to size two. What can you do? So the first thing to observe is, uh, well, I, I let me tell you the answer is that it is drastically harder, even if only back to size at most two are allowed. So I tell you the result. Uh, so so the hardness result is this: that uh, if you are given a bunch of bags of size at most q, right, uh, which are consistent with some uh, Unknown LTFF, then it is LP hard to find any function of constantly many LTFs. Forget the form, function of constantly many LTFs. Basically, you cannot find one LTF satisfying more than half of the bags, right? When uh, when Q is equal to two, uh, and that was improved to four over nine uh, in the subsequent paper. And the hardness for general Q is one over Q, right? So it becomes harder and harder as the bags uh, the bag size increases, which is uh, also not done. So this is this problem become very hard because if you have bags of size one, you can satisfy all the bags very easily in polynomial time, right? Just linear programming. But as soon as the bags become greater than uh, of size at least two, right, it becomes extremely hard. It's like constant factor hard. But uh, can you even do constant factor approximation, right? So uh, what about the algebraic approximation? Well, let me tell you the result and then I'll come back and tell you why this is actually not a trivial problem. So, for bag size two, at most two, you can actually satisfy 40% of the bags, which is slightly worse than the threshold of half, uh, or whatever four over nine. Uh, yeah, so there's still a gap, and uh, so this, that was the first one. In the second paper, all we uh, we could do was to actually for one over twelve, 
a hardness for Q twenty three. I'll tell you why these problems will become very very hard as soon as bag size increases. And for larger bags, you have some one over Q of, uh, approximation, but for some deep notion of satisfaction, not exactly uh, the notion of satisfaction that we have. So you, I mean, algorithmically also you can basically get constant factor approximation. So so that's that's a that, that's what is known. Now why is this problem? Well, first of all, linear programming clearly doesn't work. As soon as the bag size greater than two, uh, greater than one, you don't know the labels. Right? So how can you even write a linear? Program, right. Now in the uh, in the in, um, uh, bag size one case, the traditional case, even the random half space can satisfy half of the points, right? Just take, like, uh, uh, in fact, not even a random. You you take any half space that or its complement will satisfy half of the points, half of the training examples, right? But in this case, even a random, as soon as you have bag size greater uh, at least two, uh, in the bag could be like, have feature vectors which are very very close, right? Uh, but still could have a label proportion of half, which means one of them is one, other one is zero. So you have to separate those two, right? But if the angle is very small, a random LT LTF is never going to separate them, right? So you're not even guaranteed to satisfy one bag using a random LTF. So random randoms <laughs> don't work, here, right? So you, you can see, right, then this problem is now qualitatively much harder than the, uh, than the, uh, than the case of just you know traditional feature vectors and then right so so what do we do that's the oh that's just the angle between those two feature vectors if it's very close these two feature vectors are very close they reside in with the level proportion of half which means that to satisfy that bag you have to separate those two right then there will be many many such bags right now if you take a random ltf it's not going to separate those two with high Angle matters, not distance. I mean, let's say you are looking at LTF, which uh, random LTF, which uh, passes to the origin. Right. So it is actually the angle that matters. Anyway, so uh, so the we I mean, think of them as points on the sphere. Right. Yeah. And for batch size too, yeah, that's basically what you can do. Right? So. And you can also have I mean, this is when you have label proportion half. You can have label proportion zero. Or one, which means both of them should have the same level, but they could be almost diametrically opposite, right. not exactly. Right. So there is still one aspect that uh, can that can uh, you know cut them, but a random thing. Uh, sorry, that can that will not cut them, but a random one will always. Sort of, so the other uh, the, these are back side where. Um, so I just also introduce this notation. So bags where the level proportion is not one or zero. Right, which means not all of them are one or, and not all of them are zero. We call them non monochromatic bags because it's not monochromatic. And the other ones which have level proportion zero or one, they are monochromatic. Bags, right? So you can also have examples with uh, just monochromatic bags where random LT is two by one. Okay, so what do we. Yeah, yeah it's allowed. But typically, I mean, even that is not. I mean, you, uh, you can actually absorb that constant in the feature vector itself. Yeah, so I'm still wondering why angle matters in the same angle, but far away. But how are you going to like normalize? Yeah, you can normalize, right? So I'm yeah, okay. So I'm just like so think of this as the case where you have the LTF is just something that passes through the origin. Random LTF. <clears throat> yeah. But anyway, uh, you can try all these things. The random LTF is not going to work. At least I don't see how it can work. Yeah, you can, can come up with things where you have very small distance also, and it's not going to work. OK, so let's come to the algorithm, right? So you have, let's say, m bags. We are considering bags of size at most two. In fact, let's say just exactly two, right? And uh, so s of them are non monochromatic now if you know there is one trivial algorithm that that can satisfy all the m minus s monochromatic bags because you know for those feature vectors all the exact labels right any feature vector which is in a monochromatic bag you know that whether its label is either 0 or 1 right? because the label proportion itself is either 0 or 1 for those bags so you can satisfy all the feature vectors i mean you can basically satisfy all the monochromatic bags uh, just using a linear program right so that you can do 
but you, uh, you could have lots of non monochromatic bands. Right? This doesn't give you any approximation. Uh, yeah, so the question is, what do you do about the non monochromatic bands? Right, so the main algorithm that I'll talk about for the bag size 2 case. Uh, it computes in polynomial time an LTF that satisfies an expectation uh, S over 2, where S is the number of non monochromatic bags, plus M minus S over 4, uh, which is the number of monochromatic bags. That is the total number of bags that will satisfy an expectation. Right? And now, how do you get 2 over 5 approximation? Well, if the number of monochromatic bags is greater than 2 over 5 fraction, then you just use the trivial algorithm, satisfy all of them. Otherwise, you can use this, uh, this other algorithm and you can see that the uh, Approximation that is for Okay, so the main thing is how to do uh, this uh, uh, this thing for uh, non non monochromatic back size two. Okay, so firstly you can just assume that uh, everything is uh, homogeneous by just appending one to each feature vector x, so that the satisfying LTF is just a uh, sign of some homogeneous linear form. And the other thing is that you can assume that the training points are cl classified with non-zero mar margin. I mean, that's also just by shifting you can do that. Right? Uh, so that uh, that's a that's a technical things. Okay. So now what do you do? So so suppose there are x i and x j in a bag B, right? Then the the sign of the product of and let's say r star is the satisfying idea. Then r star dot x i times r star dot x j uh, is Sign uh, is less than zero if the bag B is non monochromatic because the dot products will have different signs, right? And it is greater than zero otherwise, right? Okay, so now basically now you can write this SDP, right? So uh, for every non monochromatic bag xi, xj, you write xi transpose r xj, where r is a sim uh, symmetric positive symmetric fluid matrix. Right, and for monochromatic bags, x i transpose r x j is greater than zero. For non-monochromatic bags, it's less than zero. And this has one feasible solution, which is r star r star transpose. Right. So, uh, is this clear to you? This this thing is just a semi-definite program. Okay. So now you solve the semi-definite. Yeah. That's the thing, right? So there is one LTF that classifies all the bags. That's your guarantee. You want to find that. I mean, you want to find something close to that uh, unknown LTF. Right? So that this solution, this is a feasible SDP. Uh, right? Okay, so now you solve the SDP for the symmetric symmetric PSDR and then factor it as L transpose L, that you can always do for the PSD matrix. That's it. Quite right. So let's keep it. Right? So now, uh, now if you go back. Not, not. This is not still. In, I mean. In the sense, it, it, if there is a linear, you have given me an R. It's not a. So R is doing. R is classifying bags in some sense. Yes, R is classifying bag. It's not classifying the features. So still going yeah, we know we need a uh, this thing, but it's not too too far from this now, right? Once you once you factor R as L transpose L, you get this, right? LXI dot LXJ is less than zero for non monochromatic bags and greater than zero for monochromatic bags. Right? So you have this transformation, you get this linear transformation given by L. Right? And now basically now you do this uh, standard rounding. Right? So you sample a, this is just a random hyperplane rounding, sample a G as a random standard Gaussian vector. And for non monochromatic bags, LXI dot g is uh, the sign of that is not equal to lxj dot g with probability at least half because lxi and lxj are at least 90 degrees apart right uh, for non monochromatic bags right so you can do this hyperplane random hyperplane rounding and for the monochromatic bags the sign actually is the same with probability at least half right so uh, yeah so now basically L, lx lx dot g is a linear form R, R, capital R, uh, the PhD matrix. You basically want to, that's the variable in your. I know it's just feasibility. You don't even have to be. Mm -hmm. So you can, all, yeah, you just want to find one feasible R. 
Okay. So yeah, so you do this uh, very simple, and now you can define this LTF two LTFs as cos of the sine of uh, LX dot G and sine of minus LX dot G, and H and H prime both satisfies these uh, all of these. Uh, uh, so there are so the non-monochromatic bags that have that the sine of uh, LXI uh, dot G is not equal to the sine of LXJ dot G. Half of them in expectation have that condition. They right? call them special non-monochromatic bags. So both H and H prime satisfies all those special non-monochromatic bags, which are in expectation half of them, right? And uh, one of H and H prime satisfies at least half of the special monochromatic bags. In monochromatic bags. The problem is that you need the actual, uh, you know. Uh, label proportion, right? Which is either zero or one. So you have to basically just, you know, so you can just take the best out of H and H prime, and you get the desired random LTF. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, you can choose any any distribution which is uh, like uh, rotationally symmetric. That's also fine. Gaussian is just. Uh, you, it's just a random hyperplane. All you are doing is that now you have these vectors LX, right? Uh, basically LX, right? You have all of these vectors, uh, and then you are just drawing a random hyperplane passing through the origin and using that its sign as the. Uh, so this is sort of clear, right? Yeah. So this works for non monochromatic bags. That's the algorithm, and then you combine it with the algorithm that satisfies all the monochromatic bags. Uh, and then you get this two or five Okay. Right. So now the problem. If I give you some more leeway as a, there is a linear threshold function which can be something like quadratic or an equal. Maybe, maybe I am not sure how to do that. Like, uh, I mean, it seems to me that you are getting basically a linear form anyways. I, I don't know. It could be that you could do better, but typically, if you look at, like in the other uh, supervised setting, also right, the best half space is also the best. Usually, the best uh, thing that you can do. Most. Oh yeah, the non-zero margin assumption. There is, uh, you. I mean, I'm not. This is. I'm not. I'm not written the full SDP, right? You, you need to have that the norm LX also has to have some. Uh, it should not be a zero vector. And therefore, there. Uh, otherwise, right? So those sort of technical things you need non-zero margin. Yeah, it's just a technicality. So now the problem is that when you have bags of size three, let's say bags of size three, right? Now, and it's a non-monochromatic bag. Uh, let's say, right? Uh, so you have, let's say, I give you three vectors. Two of them are one. One of them is zero. But I don't know which one is one. Which one is zero. Now, if I look at the product of the inner products with the satisfying LTF. For the satisfaction, so r dot x i times r dot x j. That sign is no longer determined. I mean, for the back exercise two, this was this was this is determined by whether the bag is monochromatic or non-monochromatic. Now this is not true. Right? You don't know the sign of this. So what what can you do? Right. To give, uh, I mean, I'll show you how to do this, but I won't give the complete proofs. The yeah, so I'm not talking. I'm not talking about that. Is it goes by a dictatorship test, and I thought it's more because that's like stuff that people have done. You're just adapting it to the setting. It's not that. I would say these things are more novel. Uh, so that's why I'm just talking about this, uh, the SDP part. Okay. Actually, I have like a not just one, but many, many. If you can take keep taking random questions. Of them, they give you very close to the. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so this is expectation, right? Yeah. So you need to take a lot of them to match the expectation. So, uh, you can create. I mean, I mean, you can do experiments with like synthetic data where you can have these points very, very close. Random LTF does like uh, extremely bad, but these things will do very well. So there are certain situations where it is actually useful. Is something you would expect to? I'm wondering for the. It's sort of a direction, but is it? Is DP have something nicer property? Let's say I just want to solve it for large dimension. 
Uh, that I don't. <laughs> Here, SDP just uses a black box. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would want to actually uh, have them scalable. But I think the bigger problem is writing the SDPs for like larger bags. These become like huge. I'll show you the, uh, how the problem with larger bags. Okay, so okay, let me come to it because we run out of time. So for let's say bag size three, right? So so I mean the key idea is to further relax R itself, the uh, the thing that we were optimizing over, right? And using this uh, partial ordering, the SDP ordering. Right. So that's for the inner order. Okay. So the observation here is that for a non-monochromatic bag of uh, a bag of size three, right, x1, x2, x3, at least one of r star dot x1 times r star dot x2 or r star dot x1 times r star dot x3 is negative. Maybe even both are negative, but at least one of them has to be negative, right? Uh, and for a monochromatic bag, uh, both of them are positive. Right? So what we will do is We'll introduce these other matrices, PSD matrices, right, which are supposed to be equal to capital R, which is in the uh, which is R star R star transpose back to a feasible solution, right? If R star dot x1 times R star dot xj is less than zero, and uh, the matrix is zero otherwise, right? So j is either two or three, and then this. So this is a if you, if you, so R one comma J is a relaxation of R itself, you know, right? So it's it basically is R when the product is uh, the product of R star dot X one and R star dot X J is less than zero and zero otherwise, right? Now then you can write similar constraints that you have, right? So you can write uh, so X one transpose R one to X two is less than zero. That's true because just by definition, right? Uh, if uh, if the inner product is, uh, I mean, the product of the inner product is less than zero, then R12 is just R, and then by definition of what R is, you get uh, you get that this constraint is satisfied. Otherwise, it's zero. So so you you have these constraints, right? So for one comma two and one comma three, you have these constraints, right? And now the other thing to note is that R12 plus R13 is at least R. It's either R or two R. That's because R star uh, R star dot x1 times R star dot x2 or R star dot x1 uh, uh, times R star dot x3. At least one of them is negative, right? So R12 or and R13, one of them has, has to be R or both of them can be R, but both of them cannot be zero. So you have this constraint also that x1 transpose R12 plus R13 uh, times uh, x1 is at least x1 transpose R x1. Right, and uh, the other thing is that these constraints you have that R is uh, like PSD greater than uh, R one J, right? So this PSD ordering is just so A is uh, this uh, PSD greater than B, A minus B is positive, right? That's uh, that's this linear order. So yeah, so you there is a slightly more involved as uh, right? So you can write this for all non-monochromatic bags. Actually, monochromatic bags are easy; you can just handle them separately. Right, so we won't even worry about monochromatic bags. Right, so the problem is that what do you do about the non-monochromatic bags? And uh, so this is what, what this is the SDP that we have. Right? At least I have not seen anything like this before. <laughs> so uh, usually SDPs are much more simpler, uh, and you don't have this sort of relaxation of the matrix. But this is indeed an SDP. So you can solve this uh, SDP for R. Uh, right. Uh, first of all, you can assume without loss of generality that x1 transpose r1 to x1 is at least x1 transpose r x1 by 2 because of that constraint. The second, uh, because of this constraint, right? You can just assume that this is the larger one, right? So you, you get this one for free basically. And now your rounding is basically the same. Factor r is l transpose l, right? But the problem here is that you don't know that the angle between lx1 and lx2, let's say. Is at least some because this is the one that you're playing with now, right? Uh, you really want to show this. Right? If this yeah. happens, then you again can do your hyperplane. Uh, so just want to understand that further. R1 to R13, R1 uh, are both matrices. So yeah. R is a tensor. Thing. It's not tensor. It's just a like. No, no. R is 
R is also, I mean, R one day is defined like this, right? It's either R or zero. I mean, in the feasible case. So yeah, this mm -hmm. SDP, in this SDP, all of these R's are matrices. They're separate matrices. And uh, one constraint has to be that X1 cannot be zero. X1 cannot be zero. Otherwise, that observation will not. The X1 will not be zero because of that. Uh, I mean, you have this uh, non-zero margin case, right? So you X1 will not be. So those are slight technicalities, but yes, but this this thing is true. And all of these are matrices. You are simultaneously solving for actually you're not. Uh, you are solving for all of these matrices. R1 J R R1 J. I mean R I comma J, right? For for all pairs and R. So lots and lots of matrices. SDP matrices, but you can all you can arrange them in a single positive semi-definite matrix, uh, right? In a diagonal, in a block diagonal way, and the, all the off diagonal, off block diagonal entries you can make them zero as well, right? So, so that's fine. You can solve this SDP somehow, right? So, uh, yeah. So let's see how we round that. And this is the key thing that we have to show that the angle between LX1 and LX2 is at least some constant. Let's say theta. Once that happens, then you are basically done. Because for back size three, all you need to split. Once you split, you can flip the sign, and one of those things will satisfy that. Uh, that guy. For non chromatic band of size three. Right? So, okay. So, so what, what we use is this novel characterization of this uh, linear order for symmetric PhD matrices. Right? So, we characterize A greater than, I mean, PhD greater than B. Uh, for uh, we gave a novel, I mean, at least I have not seen this characterization before. So what we show is that for a symmetric PSD A, we can efficiently factor it as L transpose M for all symmetric PSD A, such that for all symmetric PSD B, that condition, that condition that A is PSD greater than B implies is equivalent to this condition. There exists a C such that B is L transpose C and A is PSD greater than C transpose. So, so this is a characterization of this linear order uh, for symmetric PSD matrices, and somehow we have to we will use this to prove that that other. Thing. Okay. I mean, you can easily see that this is a triviality when a, these matrices are one cross one matrices. Right? It just means that a is a is a positive number greater than b, right? So you can always factor a as square root a times square root a, and then this is like easily observable. This generalized to matrices and this is a characterization. Uh, we'll come to a slight sketch of this proof, uh, sketch of the proof of this uh, later, but let's first use this to uh, prove what we want. Let's see, apply this to R uh, PSD greater than R12. So you get that R12 is uh, equal to L transpose C, such that R is greater than C transpose C. Okay, now you have this constraint, right? X1 transpose R12, X2 is less than or equal to zero. And now this just by the definition of what R12 is, this means that LX2, the angle between LX2 and CX1 is at least pi over 2. Because of what, so R12 factorizes as L transpose C and you get this. Right? Uh, okay. On the other hand, R is greater than PhD greater than C transpose C, which means that L transpose L is greater than C transpose C, which means that LX1 is, the norm of LX1 is greater than the norm of CX1. This is again straightforward. That's the first equation. And now the other thing is that uh, you have that other, that thing that we got for P, right? Uh, that X1 transpose R1 to X1 is at least X1 transpose R, R X1 divided by 2, right? So this means that LX1 dot CX1 is at least LX1 squared by 2, just by putting in what, what these things are, right? So, so now 1 and 2 together, so what do we have here? So LX2, the angle between LX2 and CX1 is at least pi over 2. Um, let me write this. So for 1 and 2 actually imply that the angle of LX1 and CX1 is at most pi over 3. That's because uh, you can just, um, so LX1 dot CX1 is there. You divide it by LX, the norm of LX1 times norm of CX1. right? And because of 1 and 2, you get that uh, the angle, the inner product of the normalized vectors of LX1 and CX1 is uh, at least half, right? So you get, sorry, you get, uh, you get this from just using this and this. 
from one and two, right? So now what do we have? You have that the angle between LX2 and CX1 is at least pi over two. Angle between LX1 and CX1 is less than pi over three. So one angle is greater than pi over two, the other angle is less than pi over three. So the angle between LX1 and LX2 must be at least pi over six, the difference of that. So that's what you have. In fact, and then you do a random hyperplane rounding and you get one over six, but you have to flip maybe with, because to satisfy the level proportions, you get one over four, right? And that's basically the idea. Okay, I mean, sort of clear that uh, what is happening here. Main thing was to get this uh, this thing, which was easy to get uh, when we had back size of uh, uh, two, but here you have to go through all of this and use this characterization to get some separation between LX1 and LX2. Okay, so, so let's, uh, I'll just quickly give a very, very brief sketch of this. Okay, so it's for this uh, this main level. It's, it's easy to so, see see that the. In the sense that uh, the one says the universal A. For a yeah, for a symmetric PSD. Yeah. It's not like that. You can pick and based on B. No, no, no. A A. That's why you can use it, right? Because we are factoring R. Yeah. It's not based on R one two or R IG or anything. You can factor R such that, such that efficiently factor it such that this works. That's the key. So. So first of all, the reverse direction basically just holds. It's very easy to see uh, because uh, you can take if you take uh, A to B L transpose L and B is L transpose C. That is, I mean, you just you can just use the norms, and this is that's actually very simple. I won't talk about that. Okay. So what what is this L for the reverse direction? I mean, the forward direction, right? So so you factor A as U D U transpose, where D is your uh, matrix of the eigen uh, eigenvalues, right? Uh, and then you take L to be the square root of D times U transpose. It's actually just an analog of that one cross one case where you just take the square root. And this is the one that works. I won't go into the next, uh, the rest of the step. I'll just, I'll just uh, tell you what this is. But the key ingredient that we use to actually prove this is this sure complement positive semi definiteness property, right? Uh, so you, if you have P, Q, and R, uh, uh, and cross and matrices such that P and R are symmetric, right? And you write this matrix X where, where the where P and R are the diagonal block diagonal and Q transpose Q, uh, Q and Q transpose are the off diagonal ones. Then if X is uh, a PSD, then this implies that this P is uh, P, uh, PSD greater than Q, and this is the pseudo inverse uh, of R times Q transpose. Right? Somehow we use this to prove this. Uh, this comes from some uh, discriminant of some convex function or something. Anyway, it's there on board in board in one. Right? So we use this to prove this, to prove that that thing, and we had, we started with something, and we are ending with these matrices and stuff. Right? So thing is that this these problems are interesting. They're hard. Uh, they're also interesting practically. Now. I mean. People are really looking at these problems uh, where you have aggregate data because of privacy concerns. And, uh, so, uh, so it's and the thing is that this is a wide open area. Uh, anything that you have done in computational learning for the usual case, you can just now look at it from the level proportions case, and uh, you know, and almost anything, everything is open, right? So, and by the way, here back size four is open. Four and greater open. Problem with four back size four is that it's not enough to split the back. You have to split it so that you match the level proportion, right? And it's a bit tricky. I mean, somehow. By the way, here if you look at the SDP constraints, right? I have used the SDP constraints with respect to one, one of the features, one comma three, one comma two. Uh, but maybe in the four case, you have to use all possible combinations somehow, then try to round it in a particular way. Uh, yeah, it's a. I mean, it's not easy to do. At least I could do it. Uh, that it's not a trivial. Thing, right? So all you can do is some do some weaker uh, that weaker guarantee where uh, the weaker guarantee is basically that if you have a non-monochromatic back, you just want to split it. So that you can that this analysis does. But to actually match the label proportion of non-monochromatic backs is, is tricky. Right. So and that is uh, that's uh, that's open uh, how to do that. Um, a lot of geometric analysis probably is going to require it if you want to solve it, which uh, is the idea. So. <laughs> Of course, there are many, many open questions. Extend these hardness results. And the hardness results hold only for LTFs versus LTFs. 
but can you actually do better using PTS? The question that probably you asked. Uh, right? So, uh, uh, so that is open. And of course, for other classifier classes, right? Boolean functions, uh, DNFs, so everything is open in the LLT case. So, a lot, lot of open problems here. I think they are also tougher. Maybe that's a good thing. That's why I just uh, end here. You can do better for them, possibly. I don't know the answer to this, but it's an interesting thing. I mean, for for example, these problems sometimes I mean they are like practically applicable, and you can't really give some practitioner or solve this SDP, right? These the gigantic SDPs, <laughs> and uh, right. So they want. Uh, so that's a very uh, I mean important problem from the real case. Right? Even if you manage to do not not bags small bag size like. 10, 15, or even 20, that may be important in the real world. Right? So it's actually maybe worthwhile to actually look at the feasibility of, I mean, uh, solving such SDPs. Uh, can you go back to the recent slide back? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the angle between LX1 and LX2 is mm -hmm. greater than pi by 6. This is for uh, linear L and arbitrary choose X1, X2. Yeah, yeah, that's what this is. X1, X2, it's a transformation. So if it's closed, it will separate it so that the angle becomes. And this is true for all X1, X2. So I'm wondering how that happens. Any intuition? I mean. So, so it is still linear. I mean, this is, yeah. So basically, this, this factorization, right, uh, you have here. Uh, right, you factor this R as L transpose L, that is the one that is doing the trick for you. It is basically, in a way, normalizing things in such a way that, you know, the closed things, if they, ha they have this uh, different signs with respect to R star, they become far apart. That's so right. So typically, close in distance like L1, L2, this is not possible, L1? but close in angle somehow, if this is certainly possible. Uh, yeah, we only care about angle. Intuition is yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the intuition is probably there from the back size too. This is just you know trying to soup it up for back size. And the uh, second question I had was uh, whether in, in all of these cases where you want to find linear threshold, typically we might uh, scale it up to a different uh, using a kernel trick, you might scale it up to a different uh, mapping. Uh, and then I mean, separate it in that. So, are there questions on that as well? Like, I mean, in a way, this is what it is doing in some sense. Right? It's finding a kernel where things are separated and some that. This SDP material is something like that. That's what it is doing. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, those things are usually used when you want to find a different representation where things become linear. Right? So, some linear. So, that's, that is why this is sort of applicable. Because you anywhere do that trick, you get a linear thing. On top of that, you want to apply this to find the line, linear threshold in that new state. That since hardness for something like RBF will also be interesting? Probably, yeah. I'm not very, very, very familiar with those things. So. You consider it like more, uh, this is the worst case guarantee. Yes, yeah, right? is somehow, but how about that? There's a data set, labels are there, and now I partition it into. Yeah, so we have we have some, some work on that area. Back sampled randomly from some yeah. some nice distribution, so those problems actually become easier. You don't have to solve this deeply. Some kind of learn, back learnability guarantees for those cases. Yeah, yeah. So, they, but yeah, the, here also it is sort of back learning, but the weak, very weak guarantees. But when you have random backside in certain nice spaces, 
right? Gaussians and stuff like that. We have some results which are under submission where uh, you can actually do pack learning in the sense still arbitrary accuracy. Yeah, so Thank <laughs> you.